let's just jump right right into this shit. Um, how'd you get into music? Uh, I was born into it. I didn't really have a choice. Uh, <laughs> pretty much since I was in the womb, my parents were in bands playing shows and stuff. And then all throughout my childhood, I was sleeping in the back of my dad's van while they were playing. There was like a country, western, southern rock kind of cover band shit that they were doing. But yeah, pretty much my entire life. I mean, every person in my family, literally everybody that I could think of plays something. Even my family reunions were literally just jam sessions with banjos and shit, like guitars, mandolins, works. Word. So you've just yeah. always been around it. It's I've been saturated with it since, you know, since I came out. But uh, then, like, I started playing guitar maybe when I was, like, six, I want to say. Uh, and then got serious about it probably when I was about 10. I got my first electric guitar, and that really, that's when I got excited about it. Yeah, I was about to say, because even on the first uh, album, you still you had some chops built up already. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, I guess playing forever. I don't know. It was, for the longest time, the guitar was all I played. So that was kind of, like, my, my main priority. But now I'm, like, picking up a lot of other instruments, as many as I can, because I'm trying to do as much as I can by myself now, so. So was uh, No Service Project your first musical project? Technically, I was actually in another band before that. We never played any shows. Uh, It was called Mechanically Separated Chicken, (laughs) uh, which I'm very proud to have named it. But it was an ingredient on the Slim Jim list on the back of the Slim Jim thing. You'd see the first ingredient was Mechanically Separated Chicken. But uh, that was just a couple of my brother's friends and my friends kind of getting together. Uh, And it actually featured the three original members of No Service Project. But uh, that band was supposed to get ready for practice one night, and the lead singer kept dicking us over because he had a girlfriend situation happening. So we took a... Did you ever see one of those three-person water balloon slingshots where one person holds each side and the other one holds a water balloon back and it launches? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we were shooting that at his house all night, and it was just smacking against the siding. And then eventually one took out his window, and he was screaming throughout the neighborhood. And we kept hiding behind bushes and shit. And it was just madness. But uh, eventually the cops came and the three of us got arrested and cuffed and put in the cop car. I think I was like 16 at the time. So that was pretty much the birth of No Service Project because then those three members that were arrested from Mechanically Separated Chicken kind of cut everybody else out and went on to do our own thing. Word. Word. Tell me about that fucking uh, first album, So Awesome It Hurts. That is a fucking awesome album. Oh, thank you, man. <laughs> uh, it was Technically, it was our third release locally. We put out like a, a demo disc that was just a live recorded thing. It was called uh, Live at Home Base. And it was literally just a tape recorder in the back of this warehouse that we played in, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Uh, and it was just the shittiest recording ever. But we made a couple of burned discs of that and handed them out locally. Uh, in fact, I think I just got rid of one of my last copies of it, like two, three years ago or something like that. There was some fan that wanted to buy it. So I was like, okay. Uh, after that, we actually tried to record like an actual record. It was in a trailer and some guy had like a $200 Tascam digital recorder, had no idea what he was doing. And that just sounded like a potato. Uh, so we trimmed off, we recorded a full length and had to cut it down to four songs. And so we called it four songs for you, which was, Another disc that uh, a fan wanted to grab a couple years ago, so I let them take that too. But then after that, we got to Swassman Hurts. But that was by the time I was like a senior in high school, I want to say. Uh, but that was the the first time the band became a four piece with my friend Trevor, who's actually on the cover. Uh, that black eye that he has there, he actually did to himself because he got drunk at a graduation party, and he just punched himself over and over in the face till he passed out next to a fire. And he woke up with bruises and burns all over his body. <laughs> 
but he took that amazing picture and I'm just, I'm so happy that we were able to put that out to the world because we've gotten so many comments on it over the years. It's amazing. We are the Music Makers, which is a fucking phenomenal album. Uh, tell me oh, about you, that man. one. So that one was actually the the first full length that we put out. I think it's like 15 or 16 songs. Um, and it was kind of like a collection of stuff because that So Awesome It Hurts was originally going to be a full length. We recorded it, but then we trimmed it down on the advice of actually MC Devlin told us that it might be better for a, the label to want to pick you up if you put out an EP first. Um, well, but it was it was nine tracks. That was a nine track EP. That's so that awesome one was, yeah. So awesome hurts was yeah. And uh, he when he was still in No Cash, he did that feature on Poison. Uh, but then when we started doing Music Makers, we just said fuck it, let's just do the whole thing. I'm not worried about labels anymore. I don't give a shit. Let's just do a full length because we had all the songs stocked up, you know. And then we ended up getting. Uh, well, it wasn't Chris No Cash anymore. It became MC Devlin. He came in and did the feature on Small Town Cops, which was awesome because we got like both versions of Chris to be on two records. So it was pretty cool. Word, word. Yeah, that was about four years in. That was actually, it came out not long before we first started touring and stuff. But uh, actually what a lot of people don't know is that there were two singers at that point, those first two records. Uh, I sang half the songs and then our bass player, Joe, sang the other half of the songs. And I, I guess a lot of people think that it's the same person singing the whole time. So that's kind of good to get out there, actually, that there were two singers for the first two records. Uh, but uh, that's why everything was kind of like we'd write a song with him on vocals and I would take the other half and kind of spread it out that way. But it was uh, we were kind of going through experimentation in that stage because it wasn't as like uh, focused on like the East Coast ska punk sound. Uh, it wasn't trying to do raspy vocals as much. We were trying to like expand our horizons a little bit and get a, bit, a little bit of a cleaner, tighter sound with that record. That's why there's um, there's more like straightforward ska songs on there and stuff like that. A little bit more uh, instrumentation and production value into it with like organs. And we had, I think that was the introduction of Virus Lab and stuff like that. So a lot of, a lot of learning process with that record. Yeah, yeah. And it turned out fucking awesome, like you said. Thank you. You guys were a lot tighter on that album than the first album, but, you know, it was yeah. several more years into it, so you guys just got <laughs> And then um, fucking return to paper. That fucking blew mm. my mind. Like, Thanks, like <laughs> that. Um, you can tell you uh, matured as artists. Uh, like because it's not. Some of them I can't even uh, describe what you're playing. It's just like I love that. You just That's play perfect. whatever the fuck come out, and and it turned out fucking awesome. And the tone, thank you. The tone that you have during that uh, recording, like that, especially when you, um, I want to say uh, one of them with the digital delay, it just fucking pops out, and it's so yeah. warm and clean. Fucking beautiful album. Tell me about that one. Thank you, man. Yeah, that that was a fucking work in progress. Uh, progress. It was after we had got back from. We did a couple tours with Mac and Doctor, uh, like to Chicago and back. We did like the New England states. Uh, we did a, a whole East Coast leg by ourselves at one point. Uh, and Chris actually helped us book a lot of those shows too. He gave me a whole list of contacts, like right after No Cash broke up and before he started Mac and Doctor. And so uh, we did a little bit of touring extensively, and we were kind of writing another record that would have been more in line with uh, We Are The Music Makers. But after I got back from tour, I just I started really digging into a lot of different music. And I was like, you know what, fuck it. We're just going to scrap all that old shit. And we're just going to start fresh, like almost as if we were a brand new band, which is kind of what the theme of Return to Paper is. And it's like a way of saying back to the drawing board, essentially. So that's essentially what we did is just try to recreate ourselves and as musicians, as uh, a band in total, even our aesthetic, everything kind of changed at that point. 
but it was a it was a long arduous process to get that record done we started recording it at uh dan mckinney's or mc kinney's uh studio uh we did that for i want to say six to eight months maybe until that kind of fizzled out and we had to go to our former studio jl studios with joe loftus in uh i forget where that was that was somewhere near wilkes but uh he kind of helped us finish the record we had to redo a lot of the vocals redo a lot of the mixing and stuff like that and we added in a whole lot of extra production stuff like there's a lot of like i think in the song ugly there's audio tracks of us like stomping on a big plate of wood that we had there uh played a salt shaker on it there's all kinds of weird percussion just thrown in i think that song kick in that breakdown there's like a latin breakdown in the middle of it i think there was like 60 some tracks of different percussion items in there so it was, it was wild it was a nightmare to mix i'm sure but both dan and joe did a great job with it and that they're very responsible for helping us get the, the tones everything just perfect the way we wanted it to so but uh, yeah, that digital delay was that and learning seventh chords on guitar kind of like restructured the way I, I thought about songs. And it, it added a whole new tone and vibe to all of our stuff, uh, especially like uh, digital tape delay is what we used on Return to Paper, I think. And that's what gives it that warm kind of saturated echo at the end of it. It just sounds beautiful. I always thought it sounded great. So and I hear a lot of people say that uh, that's their favorite song a lot of times. And they, they all talk about it. I think Elliot from uh, We the Edens and Doom Scroll, Escape from the Zoo. He was actually in our band for a little while too after Return to Paper came out. I think he was with us for about a year. But he told me the first time he heard that song, he was on tour with, uh, I don't remember if it was... Atrocity Solution. It was, it was probably Atrocity Solution, yeah. But he said he just laid in, in his van on the floor and listened to it and he was just like zoning out to it. I was like, fuck yeah, that's exactly what I want. That's perfect. So it was cool. But... Uh, it just it took a long time to get out and we kept hitting roadblock after roadblock we lost our guitar player in the middle of recording and it was just so many things we kept running out of money i funded so much shit by myself i had to pay for the the cds to get pressed and all that stuff i had to pay i actually had a cool australian artist do the cover and the whole insert uh if you get a copy of the cd in fact i'll send you one it spreads out to this nice spread it's beautiful he does like photo realistic stuff where he actually makes models like there's actually paper models that he made of the city on the foreground and he'll kind of photoshop in the background and stuff like that and he had the clouds hanging down there paper as well but uh he did a really amazing job but that was another thing that just it was all independently funded so it just kept costing and costing we had to keep waiting till we got paid again so we could do more and i think it was a total of like two years since we started it that we were actually able to finally put it out but it was it was a labor of love for sure <laughs> And it wasn't until there was, what, a 12-year gap, and then you released a, a, a song in October in 2021, Jelly Jam? Oh. <laughs> I, I guess that's a song. It's that's just kind of me dicking around on. I, it's when I actually first started. Uh, I, I got the this computer and like a uh, first time experimenting with Logic. I kind of grew up playing around with different DAWs and stuff like that when I was a kid. But this was the first time that I was trying to like just write demos on this. And as I kept playing with it, I was like, it actually kind of sounds cool. It doesn't sound that bad. And I just kept adding more and more stuff. And I just the way that I am, I have ADHD, and I have to keep adding more constantly to it. And it just ended up fleshing out and sounds like a legit song. And so I'm getting to a point now where it's just like, I can just kind of produce the entire thing myself. And the more I learn about how to use the DAWs and stuff, like it really, like, it's just, it's crazy to think that like, we used to be so prevented and be up against this wall of having to afford to go to a studio constantly. And now with technology and the, the stuff that I'm learning, I'm able to do so much just from at home here. So it makes a huge difference. But uh, yeah, Jelly Jam was just a weird thing that I kind of slapped together quickly because I wanted to just let people know, like, yes, I am. I'm working on stuff, but it's going to be a little bit of time before I can really get my skills up to snuff here. But that was I think that song, I just recorded some quick drums and bass. And then I threw two guitar parts over top of each other without listening to either one. And I tried to do as similar of a solo as I could, but just slightly alter it. And they actually harmonize at really cool points accidentally, which is kind of neat. 
But uh, yeah, I just, I kind of put that up. I, I, I called it waiting music, I think at the time. It's like, you know, just keep patient, we'll get there. There's stuff coming. And so since then, you have been working on some stuff then, huh? Because I see you oh, in yeah. the background right now. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been going crazy with it for the last six months. I, I took, when I moved to California four years ago, I want to say, maybe three and a half, uh, it took me a while to kind of get my bearings and like reacclimate to a whole new place. And uh, I don't really know anybody out here except for my partner, uh, who is actually one of our biggest fans. I've known her forever. She had seen us on our very first tour in 2007. And she kind of kept in touch with us over that time. So uh, she kind of came to my rescue when I was at a really low point in my life. Uh, and uh, the more we talked, the more we got to know each other. And then uh, I ended up moving out here. And it's just been awesome. I absolutely love the scene out here. I love, obviously, the weather. Uh, there's just so much more to do, especially me coming from that tiny-ass town, you know. Uh, I lived in Philadelphia for like 10 years prior to that. But the experience here is just infinitely better. It's just it's such a mass of like concrete which i love because i'm not too into nature I, I like cities and stuff uh because I, I had enough woods and trees when i was a kid so now it's like i like to see new and interesting places and this is definitely one of them it's very cool word everything because like I, like you said you didn't have you don't have too extensive of a discography i am excited to yeah. hear about some new stuff um cool. we didn't get into your you were in mad conductor for a little while tell me about that i was yeah when we were doing those tours we did a couple tours in 2006 and 2007 it was kind of right after music makers came out and right before we started writing return to paper and uh mad conductor's guitar player couldn't be there for a couple tours so i filled in for him on guitar and actually uh our old guitar player was also the drummer of mad conductor during that time so it kind of just worked out that the two bands you know we can just pack into you know, our van and their car and hit the road and we could just swap members back and forth and it was, it was pretty awesome it was one of the funnest times of my life for sure but uh yeah i played guitar for them for a while uh i was actually the first guitar player i think that chris asked to be in mad conductor when he was starting it up as a live band i remember uh before he was doing a live band it was he was trying to do a thing where he plays like a backing track and then has him and a couple of his hype man like rap over that and uh he did his first live performance at a bowling alley that we played way back in the day and uh we got to witness that and i don't think he was happy with it so he eventually went on to fill out the whole live band and uh i was supposed to play for that but i was too focused on my own shit kind of each time that i was in the band i had to eventually pull back because i had to do my own How far off is this new recording I'm seeing back there? Because now, now I'm uh, seeing it, I'm all excited. It looks like you got something kicking right now. Dude, I, I have, uh, well, started tracks, I have probably 50, but <laughs> <laughs> the ones that I'm, I'm close to being finished with, I've got about 10. I'm hoping to rack up enough that I can decide if I want to do a full length or if I want to do a couple of EPs and really like stagger the releases. Because uh, it's been 15 years since we put anything out other than the jelly jam thing <laughs> but yeah i i uh i gotta figure out what the best way is i know a lot of people are doing the the eps only approach thing right now or just putting out singles and stuff but i'm just i'm such a fan of old school records where you like go through the whole experience beginning to end so it's kind of like weighing like you know the convenience of modernity versus like what kind of art i appreciate and so i gotta figure out what's what's right for that but yeah i've got at least uh, a full length coming uh, possibly more than that even so but I'm, I'm gonna guess it's probably gonna be till the end of the year before i'm 
finally happy with it. Actually, I wouldn't even say that because I'll never be happy with it. I, I'm always <laughs> going back in to re-edit and fix. I, I'm just never stoked on it. I can't listen to any of my old records now because it just drives me crazy. I want to fix everything. So if I can manage to just do it and step back, then hopefully by the end of the year, I'm hoping to have it up. And then we'll do like merch drops and stuff like that too and hopefully play some shows. Word, word. That's fucking awesome.